Hey everyone, welcome to the garage, the workbench. Um, so the last couple of days I've been messing around with the gauge cluster for that 2000 Ranger. Now, I didn't have any problems with my, the one that came with it, the factory one, which is this one. Your standard, your standard gauge cluster that would come in a 2000 Ranger. Speedometer, you know, various sundry gauges, no big deal. Really bland, kind of boring, no tack, which I like to have a tack. Anyway, I was kicking around the internet and realized, found out that uh, they make a set of white face gauges that look pretty awesome, which here they are. Look pretty awesome. I think they look a lot cooler than the uh, original set that came in there. And uh, they have a tack, and it's just cooler all around. I really like them. They have this gray backing piece. And uh, so I was like, well, that sounds great. I mean, you know, they should probably plug in. I'd like to have a tack, so let's try this out. So I go to the junkyard, and I pull one. And, uh, you know, no big deal. I was like, great, should be fine. It's supposed to be plug and play. I read on the Internet, because, you know, the Internet never lies. The direct blo direct bolt in, plug right in, no problem. Your car already set up for attack, so no big deal there. And I was like, great, sounds good, makes sense. So I go and buy one. You know, not a lot. I think it was like 15 bucks, whatever. Well, what I don't, what I didn't know, and what the internet doesn't tell you, as I guess you're supposed to already magically know this, because I I didn't. But on the back of the mod, on the back of the cluster, is a board that plugs in. Looks like this. This is it. That is an anti-slosh module. It is for the fuel gauge. What it does is it evens out or takes an average of the fuel level over time so that your gauge isn't constantly moving all the you know around like this while you're going around corners and stuff. So that's cool, but without it your gauge won't work. And you know, various different people on the internet said, oh I just bypass it, no big deal. Well I tried that. And uh, you can't just bypass it. It still doesn't work properly, regardless of what anybody says. Now this is a very important piece of information. The gauge I can the factory gauge I have is out of a 2000 Ford Ranger single cab long bed 4.0 engine. Engine doesn't matter. But uh, what will fit? Well, what will fit? And there's a lot of conflicting information on the internet about this. And this is what I'm here to try to dispel. Try to shed a little light because I spent several hours at the uh, salvage yard the other day looking at different dashes, pulling out probably a dozen because they're not really that hard to pull out. And uh, what will fit is 2001 that has the white face gauges. Is 2001 to 2003 Ford Sport Track and Ford Explorer Sport, not regular Explorer, but the Explorer Sport, the two door models. That is the only thing that will fit. Now, anybody tells you different, they're wrong. Or, you know, because I literally looked at probably 60 Explorers, and the dash in a normal Explorer from 01 to 03 will not fit properly. You will have to modify it. I'm looking strictly for plug and play. So, I get them home, and this isn't working. Dash is, you know, the fuel gauge isn't working. And, well, that's one of the most important gauges. you got to have the fuel gauge. So, I go back to the junkyard and find a couple of these, pick them up, bring them home, put the thing in, and, you know, there's a bunch of different stuff going on here, and all these different boards, and I actually picked up another, if you'll see, I got several dashes now, because I just picked several of them up, because they're pretty cheap, and as hard as these things are getting to find, I figured I might as well have some spares, but, uh, I was looking at a lot of these boards are kind of chintzy looking. Like they're not in the best of shape ever. This one's kind of okay. But, uh, you know, this car had 324,000 miles on it. That's uh, They got every bit of good out of it. But what I thought I'd do is show you how to disassemble these. So that you can, if you, maybe you have a bad fuel sending unit on one so you get another one. I was just going to show you real quick and dirty how these work. Because... I haven't done this for the last couple of days, taking them out, cleaning things, looking at stuff, figuring out about that module. I got myself a bit of an education on these. So I thought I'd share what I could with you. 
about that. Now what you need is a T15 Torx bit and it takes out the two, three, four, five, six, the seven little screws around the face of this thing. I took them all out with this one for dramatic effect. So, if you ever want to swap around gauges or anything like that, once you get all seven of those out, this just pulls right off. No muss, no fuss, and there you are. You're left with your bare gauge cluster. And now that's pretty cool in and of itself, but uh, you know you have to ask yourself, is there someone else do I need to take apart? What else needs to come off for this to function? And uh, not a lot, really. Technically, this should already be out if you're doing this. It's just your two little clips, and I'll show you that. See, this is your selector knob. It's got a spring on the back. And this would be coming from your shifter on the column, and it'll just pull. And uh, that's what shows you what gear you're in. So parks fully extended but you think it'd be the other way to take the tension off the spring but apparently not so whatever but that's how that works and you've got to see this is where the actual cable comes in that would operate this right here this is where it comes in I just cut it off because I don't need it but you've got a clip if you're looking at it like this when you pull it out it'll be you'll be staring at it like this there's a clip here at the back there's a clip right here at the back and you'll push that towards the front of the car and this will come out. On the other side there's a clip right here and you'll push that in and this whole mechanism just drops right out and you can put it wherever you want. There's enough play that you can put it wherever. So to get the actual gauge pods out uh, the order of operation is only marginally important. Once you take a look at it you realize how this goes together. These two side pieces have to come off first before the center section can come off. Now I'm using a just a flat it's a dental tool because I have this dental tool otherwise I just use a screwdriver so what you do is see where it comes you can see where they're put together you just take whatever flat tool you're using and pry it under one side and just kind of work around pry it underneath the other side relatively gently but you're not gonna hurt this thing the corner and then you'll feel it pop out and then they just lift right out and you'll see on the back these are the two alignment pins right here on the top and bottom they go right in here but they go on top of the main section so that's why you can't take that out first and on the back here are your pots that control whichever gauge it is and there's the connection points and I'll go into those in a little more detail in a minute once you get that out just set it aside and it's the exact same procedure for the other side, just gently pull it out. What you're doing is actually just pulling the contacts for the pots out of their homes. And I'll show you this. You're just pulling these pins out of their home. That's really what's holding this thing together. But, uh, that's all it is. Same two alignment holes. You've got all your backlit stuff. Your lights are all in here. And then it comes to the main, the main show. It's the exact same operation. You just want to take your time pry up around it because what you're doing is pulling more of those pins out of their connectors so you want to just nice and evenly go around it whatever but that just lifts right out and then you're left with the main body which is nice you can see all your lights most of these are blown but uh, and dead bugs and stuff that's always fun but see right here you have the actual clips and that's what the pins lock into and that's really what holds the thing in place and that's where all your connections are made back here on the back and it really is super easy to figure out where everything goes you can literally just trace the line and see where it goes to and where the connection is going to be for the lights and for everything else and you can test for continuity if you have a voltmeter uh, that's one of the few things I recommend buying a good one of buy a good voltmeter buy a decent voltmeter it's one of the few things that you really really do need. And let me go ahead and I'm going to set up and I'm going to pull the whole circuit board off the back so you can see what that's all about. But just give me a second to get my stuff together for that. 
So anyway, where were we? Oh, right. Pull the circuit board off this thing. So not that big a deal, not that scary. First thing you want to do is take all the bulbs out. So they all just twist out. Nothing super special there. I always start with the big ones because they're the easiest to get out. The small ones probably have to use some kind of pliers. Not a huge deal. Oh, and the uh, fuel gauge will not work without that anti-slosh board in there. I even tried jumping it, like some of the uh, internet posts talked about doing, by just jumpering these two, which technically makes sense if you trace them back. They do go to the fuel, and you would think it would work, and just not compensate for slosh. If you went around a corner, it would just, you know, all the time move. Doesn't work uh, at all, so there's that. Just so you know, you have to run that board, and I don't think you can technically bypass it and have it work properly. So, you've got your diodes, and those are easy enough to check. If you need to know how to check diodes, there's a thousand videos on that. And again, that's why you need a good voltmeter. Very few things in this world that I'll actually advocate you buy a name brand or something you know good or spend some money on, but that is actually one of them. Now, the only tricky part of this whole operation is these little clips. And these are the ones that interface with uh, pins on the back of your pots for all of your gauges. And uh, that's what makes the connection so that they function. Now, they're not, <clears throat> from the back, they look like they're just about impossible to get out. And they are impossible from the back. From the front, however, not really that big a deal. Just take you some needle nose pliers squeeze them together and push down and they just basically push straight on down now once you get them all pushed in what you do is let me show you exactly what you're working with put it on the plier here get my fat fingers out of the way this is what they look like that's what you see from the back That's all it is, just a regular old clip, nothing special, just a ton of them. So before you actually just go ahead and pull the board off, go ahead and take whatever flat instruments you've been using to pry this stuff up and go around and pull the board off of these little locating tabs all around the board so that you don't put any extra stress on it, the board while you're pulling it up. There's only a few, just go around, go into there them up and then the board will just pull off for cleaning purposes or diagnostics so you can see this one's kind of gross there's a fair amount of corrosion in the board and also uh, this board is two pieces sandwiched together I don't know if you've noticed you probably if you haven't I have one of parts you wouldn't know, but you see there's actually two layers to this board, and they're both separate. There we go. See? There's two different layers to the board. I didn't separate mine all the way because I didn't have to. But you could pretty easily, uh, and that would be for cleaning purposes. It doesn't seem to matter as far as the adhesive on these because they are adhered together. But uh, I took, on the one that's in the car now, that I had to clean because the fuel side had apparently had some water damage on it. I separated the board all the way from here on the end to this first diode. So this entire section I folded up, took some uh, thousand grit sandpaper, cleaned all the contacts around the fuel sending unit and uh, the uh, what is it? the uh, temperature gauge. Cleaned that up, cleaned all the contacts. For where it goes into the uh, connectors into the dash into the truck I put it back down and the locating tabs here that are on the back of the cluster actually do serve to hold it down and I had no problems I didn't have to use any adhesive to keep it down but that's literally all there is to these it's a lot like a Jeep so if you've ever had a Jeep that's exactly what these are like only instead of being just one piece like the jeeps these are actually two sandwiched together like i was saying so you can see here they just peel apart no problem there's your copper 
contact for the bottom and a copper contact for the top and uh, not, a, not a lot to it. Also, interesting aside, um, if your airbag light is on and you want it to be off and you go ahead and pull the bulb out while, you've, while you're doing this just because you don't want to look at it, there's a module behind the radio that will beep the same way the airbag light used to blink. And uh, if you want to be slick like I thought I was going to be and disconnect that module so it would beep, the uh, speedometer won't work. So that module is also responsible for the speedometer function, which is awesome. Didn't know that. So, um, yeah. So, and of course, the installation is just the reverse of the removal. Uh, what I want, what I like to do, what I've had good success with, is uh, just taking the tabs, or locating tabs, pushing them back down. And the only thing that's marginally tricky is just getting these seated back in their spot just because you want to push them down but other than that they literally just click right back into place as soon as you line them up See? nothing to it uh, all back together make sure everything's back where it needs to go you get the locating tabs just push them down and uh, I can go ahead and reassemble this thing and I guess I can just edit it as needed but uh, Basically, it's just a whole bunch of clicking lights back in. Now, see, once you've got these all clicked back in, they click in firmly. They're not going to push back out because they have little tabs on the uh, top that spring back out. Super great design, actually. And uh, your order of operation for putting it back together is the same as taking it apart. You'll just take this part right here. You'll line it up with these locating holes here. and You've got your locating tabs uh, right here. locating tab here and here and you just push it down it clicks right in there you go just make sure they're fully seated and you're good to go take the uh, cover slide it back on throw your bolts in it or your screws back in it all uh, seven of them and you're good to go I have seen some people that pull the gauge needles and stuff off uh, I tried that on the original one I did not have the best of success. I got it back on and uh, you know it worked fine but uh, I did not like the amount of force required to pop these needles off of here. And you know I was going to do it to roll the odometer to match the car instead of being about 2,000 miles uh, off. Because the car's got like 141, the cluster I put in has like 143 or 144. So I was thinking about just changing it to match exactly. But uh, after pulling that first needle off, I don't think it's worth it. And uh, I like my gauges to be relatively accurate. I, I kind of depend on them. So uh, that's what I have to say about that. Go ahead and slip that back in there. There we go. And there you go, one fully assembled cluster, ready to go. Uh, you can also put LEDs in this with absolutely no modification or issue. I put all LEDs in the cluster I'm running, and uh, they work just fine, no issues. They dim, everything works great. I didn't have to put any kind of weird wiring in or anything like that. So, uh, like I said, just to close it out, if you're wanting to do a uh, white face upgrade in a 2000 Ford Ranger, and you want to tack, your car is already equipped with the uh, wiring for the tack. It will work, no problem. You also uh, do not have to change anything else on the car other than just this piece, as long as you have that anti-slosh module. And the one that came in the car in 2000 in the original dash is different than the one on these white face gauges. And I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. This is the one that came out of the original 2000 Ford Ranger dash I had. It is different than the one that comes out of these white face gauges with the tack. And I'll show you the difference right now. Because this is something I would have liked to have seen. This is the one, this is the anti-slosh module for a 2000 Ford Ranger with no tack, black gauges. This is the anti-slosh module for a 2001 to 2003 Ford Sport Track or Ford Explorer Sport. The difference is staggering. And uh, they will not fit in the same slots. 
So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, part number doesn't seem to matter because I've tried the anti-slosh modules out of, out of an 01 and an 03 and one was a sport track and the other was a sport. They're exactly the same. They click in and out. They both work. It's some of the cross testing I was doing while I was messing around with these dashes. But just so you know, the anti-slosh module for the 2000 Ranger without the tack is substantially smaller than the one you're going to use with these white face gauges. So something else you need to keep in mind. Yes, these white face gauges will directly directly bolt up but it has to be from a 2001 to 2003 Ford Sport Track or a Ford Explorer Sport, the two doors. Otherwise they will not fit. The Ford Explorers, I checked them out, I pulled them, I looked from about 99 all the way to 04 because I had a bunch of these cars in the junkyard and they are they are different. They will not bolt up. All right, well, I hope you found this informative, and I hope that uh, this saves you some time and some trouble that I had trying to figure out how all this worked. And uh, I'll see you next time.